Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you happen to be today. I'm Sarah Fee, ROM Senior Curator of Global Fashion and Textiles at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I'm also curator of the ROM original exhibition, Cloth That Changed the World, India's Painted and Printed Cottons, which is on display, I am thrilled to say, until January 2022. And the ROM, in fact, will be opening its doors this coming weekend. So any of you who have not had the opportunity to, to see the exhibition, now is your chance. I'm delighted you could join us for today's Curator Conversation, a digital project program that explores themes and subjects from ROM collections alongside industry professionals. I would like to take this opportunity to thank TD for their ongoing support of this program. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. So today's program is in support of our exhibition, The Cloth That Changed the World, India's Painted and Printed Cottons. And we would like to acknowledge the ongoing support of our Royal Exhibition Circle donors in making ROM exhibitions possible. This is actually the sixth in our series of online curator conversations connected to the exhibition. Uh, past episodes have focused on things ranging from the domestication of cotton in India thousands of years ago, to issues of enslavement and dye production in Sri Lanka in the 18th century. And I encourage you to watch these if you haven't seen them already, and the links can be found on our exhibition website page. Now, an important aspect of these programs and our exhibi exhibition itself is to give voice to contemporary artists who have sustained and revitalized painted and printed cottons in India using natural dyes uh, in recent uh, decades. And so it is my very great pleasure to welcome my guests for today's conversation. Direct from Damadka Kutch Gujarat, uh, if we can please have Jabber and Adam turn on their camera. Uh, uh, we have with us Abdul Jabbar Mohammed Khatri, whom I will be referring to as Jabber in our program today. He is a 9th century block printer and dyer from his village of Damadka. He is renowned for Ajrak, a resist and mordant printed textile that is dyed with natural dyes, and his father was a pioneer in this revitalization. He'll have more to say on that. Uh, the specialty of this cloth being that's printed on both sides with complex geometric and floral patterns. He has been conferred with a National Craft Award from the Government of India in 2003, the Seal of Excellence from UNESCO in 2008, an Innovation and Creativity Award from the Government of Oman in 2011, and an Award in Excellence in Handicrafts from the World Crafts Council in 2014. Jabber's textiles are included in museum collections around the world, including the DNA in London, the Ashmolean Museum of Oxford, the Textile Museum of Washington, DC, and of course, the Royal Ontario Museum Toronto, on display in our exhibition is one of his masterworks, which he titled Honeycomb, and he'll have more to say about that later. He is joined with us today um, by his son, Adam Cutry, who is a 10th generation expert in block printing and natural dyes. And for any of you who were at uh, the ROM's Jode Per Ball of 2018, it was Adam who designed uh, the kerchief and the stoles that were part of the welcoming gifts and it was um, Jabber and Adam's uh, workshop that produced them for the ROM in record time. So Adam uh, hopefully will be sharing with us some of the work that he has done during lockdown. So Adam, can I kindly ask you to start sharing your screen, please? And maybe you want to advance it um, to slide three. And our second guest today is direct with us from the UK. Uh, Dr. Ilanid Edwards. Dr. Edwards is Professor of Global Cultures of Textile and Dress at Nottingham Trent University and a research associate at the Royal Ontario Museum. Her research focuses on textiles, dress, fashion, and craft production in India and has addressed the role of state agencies, NGOs, artisans, and entrepreneurs in the field of craft development. Her research has been widely disseminated through conferences, exhibitions, and publications, including 
block printed textiles of India, imprints of culture, which won the R.L. Shep Award of 2016. Mine is a much dog-eared copy now. Uh, and textiles and dress of Gujarat in 2011. And of course, she contributed an important chapter to our exhibition catalog, Cloth That Changed the World, The Art and Fashion of Indian Chins. She is currently developing a project about tailors in India and the Indian diaspora. And I believe they can correct me if I'm wrong, but Jabber and Ilanid have been working together for over 25 years. Uh, we joke that it takes a village to tell the complicated story of India's painted and printed cottons. So today the four of us will be something of a tag team working from three continents uh, to share some of the stories behind this. So just as a reminder, during our program, you can submit any thoughts or questions via the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen, and we will have some time at the end to answer your questions. So uh, Jabber, Adam, and Ilanid, thanks again for joining us. I know we're also uh, in different time zones, so it's actually evening for the country. So thank you so much uh, for maybe skipping your dinner hour and being with us tonight. So Thank I'm you. going to, yes, welcome. Um, I will start with just a very basic question to help orient our viewers today. So if Jabber, if you could please tell us about your family's history of printing. Um, I know you are a ninth generation printer. So if you could please uh, tell us a little bit more about this history and Adam, maybe you could advance to slide uh, three, please. Yeah. Ajrak is a speciality of desert, desert region of Kutch, Thar in Rajasthan and Sindh in Pakistan, where it is made by the Khatri community. We print cotton cloth on both sides using modern and resist and dye it in indigo and madder, and process take many days to complete. Yeah, process for what are you? Uh -huh. okay. our, cust our traditional customer are Maldari, animal herders. They use ajrak as dress and wear it is lungi, solder cloth, and turban. It is my hereditary craft, and I am the ninth generation of my family to work as a block printer and dial in Tamadka. My father, Mohammed Siddiq, Mohammed by my father name, Siddiq, my grandfather, Mohammed Siddiq, taught me the craft like old dial in Kutch from Kutch. From about 1945 onward, he worked with the chemical colors, which our customer like it because they were bright and uh, uh, for us, they were cheap and easy to use. But he was concerned that we were losing our heavy dietary knowledge and said, this is our traditional craft, but this is, these are not our traditional color. So he started start working with natural color again, indigo matter and iron for black and taught me and my brother Abdul Razak and Dr. Ismail how to use them. 1972-73, our family has worked only with natural dye. And uh, this one is a uh, ninth generation work because the uh, our grandfather came to Sin and uh, chose the Damadka because the here a river and a running water, then the people is uh, in Ajrak process is uh, uh, water is important. So they uh, uh, choose the Damadka. And this work uh, is a uh, skill are from father to son. I learned from my father to, uh, he had learned the uh, uh, craft from his father going right back to our family roots in the sin. Because uh, the Adam, could we see, please see slide number eight, please? I think it's it's a wonderful photo that um, yeah. that shows uh, Jabber as a 
as a, a young apprentice prentice, we can see him uh, second uh, from the left there uh, with his father in 1977. So this is you still um, uh, learning. So how old were you when you began to, to learn to print, Jabber? I am eight years old. That time I'm starting uh, printing because the, this was um, housework, you know, that time is no, nobody worker that time and uh, all family together and making work. So I am study daytime in a study and evening time, some helping to cooking some pears, yeah, cooking, uh, making some register, uh, uh, lime and gum making pears. And uh, sometime is my father is uh, night time also printing because the lime and gum is uh, uh, thicky and the daytime is a little bit problem dry, much dry. So my father is uh, uh, want to printing in evening time. So that time we are learning uh, printing uh, start that uh, I am eight years old, that, uh, that time I am a start. And Adam, how old were you when you started helping? So I, uh, uh, same I start, uh, I'm uh, when childhood and I'm studied in school. So after free time, my grandfather taught us uh, uh, for uh, uh, some, some days of uh, block carving or making a tray with a bamboo stick and uh, uh, and after printing start. So in a uh, school time, uh, when our vacation, that time we are printing in uh, our, in, with grandfather. Yes, and after 2004, I started with uh, fully work with my father. Excellent. Okay, Ilana, did you have anything to add on on that topic? Um, no, I think I think Jabba covered it pretty pretty comprehensively. Great. Um, okay, I know our audience is going to have a lot of questions because it's something we really emphasize in the exhibit itself is the technique. We've already heard some hints about the resist, the matter. Uh, the gum, the having to print at night, all these complicated technical questions about how you make it. So, Ilanid, can you tell us what makes Ajrak special, why it's different from the other printing traditions in India that you've studied and written about? Um, I suppose most obviously because it's, um, it's a double-faced textile, so it's printed on both sides of the fabric and the test of a printer's skill is that the patterning on each side aligns perfectly so um, you know they test this by holding it up against the, the sunlight. Um, I think, I think um, the other thing about it is um, it's often been described as Islamic art and indeed the majority of the um, patterns su suggest that but when you actually study it, scrutinize it, there, there's actually a lot of other stuff going on and I think it actually represents the meeting point of, of a number of, of different um, influence. So obviously Islam is there, but um, if you look at the folk embroideries of Kutch, Sindh and Ta in Rajasthan, um, especially um, the embroideries made by Hindu communities like Rubaris and Ahi, a lot of the florals actually are evident in the print work of the country. So there's, you know, there's this sort of flow back and forth between the religious communities. And um, I think simply from the fact that, um, you know, they inhabited the same geographical and social space. So um, those, um, you know those designs um, just flowed from one community to the next. Well, I suppose the precision of the the, the countries of, of kind of the um, this generation of countries and the the ninth and tenth of, of reinvigorated um, Ashraq with with a kind of precision that you get in Islamic tessellation. And for example, Jabra and Adam look globally for patterns to incorporate into. Um, Ashraq. So they're not just using the um, portfolio of designs that are, are to be found in, in, in Kutch and the other desert regions where it's produced, Sindh and Pa. They're, you know, they look at, um, they're looking at um, the Alhambra, they're looking at the um, Moorish architecture of Seville, they're looking at um, 
uh, the you know modern architecture coming out of the Gulf states. So the the influences they draw on now um, represent a, a, a sort of pan global um, Islamic culture. And I think um, the other thing, a couple of things perhaps to say about Ashraq, um, it's it's um, it, it reflects uh, the, the traditional Ashraq of red, blue and black. It, it captures those ancient dyes that, you know, go back to Indus Valley. So the madder and iron and um, indigo. And it also, again, it's, um, it's designs link to, um, historically to the Arab world. And I think you had Ruth um, Barnes speaking in an earlier session um, about the Fustat, um, fragments so um you know it's it's antecedents are to be found there and i think it's it it really captures india's um various influences perhaps more so than than other textiles and apart from that it reminds me of eternity you follow the the patterns in in death you know they go on ad infinitum it's a very meditative cloth in my eyes i i think that the picture that we're looking at on the screen illustrates that's very well. We, we see Jabbar printing with actually these tiny printing blocks, not maybe some of the larger ones that we've grown accustomed to. And you can just see the precision in what he's doing and the intricacy of the design he's making. And I know towards the end, we'll see the amazing masterwork that um, he made uh, for the ROM after uh, a lot of, of, of um, experimentation and um, dissatisfaction with the imperfection until he had what he considered it perfect. While we're on this slide, it I think uh, it would be uh, useful and interesting if Jabber could tell us about what we're looking at, the different stages in making Ajrak, because we've been talking about resists and dyeing and printing, and without getting at maybe the complexity of how long it takes to get from that white cloth that you see on the far left, at least on my screen, and then the complete you know, dark, deeply dyed uh, pattern cloth on the right. So uh, how many steps does it take, Jabber, to, to make what I know you say the one that we see here is simple, to make even this simple cloth that we see here, if you can just tell us a bit about the steps. Uh, uh, 17 to 18 uh, states. And uh, start we uh, for this one for a white cloth. And uh, uh, first is covering for uh, start remove. And uh, that uh, we use the uh, uh, camel dung, castor oil, and soda ash. And uh, that one three day process. And uh, after first dyeing in marivalum powder, this one, and uh, dry in the sunlight. And uh, second day is printing in gum paste. And uh, this one uh, is a one side paste, uh, one side printing. And uh, this one, this piece is two side printed. And uh, after uh, here is a black printing, black eye making for rusty iron and jaggery and tippy floor. And uh, uh, third is here is a little bit alum printing with a tamarind seed powder. And uh, fourth here for alum with a clay millet floor and uh, gum arabic. And after dying in indigo for one time, and uh, this is two time indigo dying, and uh, after uh, two time dying in washing for this whole piece, so that uh, uh, extra material all is gone for in the water, and the design is uh, clean. And uh, after washing and dry in the sunlight and uh, boiling with alizarin, we want to we want what you we want color then we boiling with uh, color we want to red then boiling with mad, uh, green, then coming red we boiling with a uh, madder root coming orange we boiling with henna is coming yellow we boiling with uh, rhubarb coming brown and uh, this one is uh, uh, usable no problem that one all color is passed this one after wash and uh, boiling that one but here is again process because the uh, our customer is uh, animal herder they want to very dark color because the, they are going to in the sunlight and desert area 
so we are again printing here lime and gum and uh, some alum with clay and millet flour and dyeing in indigo one time and second time dyeing and after washing and boiling with the alizarin and the same of the boiling with madder root yeah boiling with henna then coming a different color so this one is double process so we are calling meena kari ajrak so this one is traditionally uh, uh, ajrak process amazing uh, yeah i think we start to appreciate just even a little bit of how complicated this science and art is uh, so thank you very much for that um can you tell us a little bit i mean we've gotten some hints so far about how the business has changed in your lifetime jabber and maybe adam can comment afterwards you know how have things evolved from what you're showing us now i mean from my understanding what you're showing us here is what you know you made in the time of your father so with the herders and but then things have changed since since the 1970s if you can tell us about how it's changed in your lifetime please in my lifetime the big change has been from business with local customer to working with national and international client by the 1970s polyester fabric had reached the local market and were popular because were bright colors and cheap demand for our textile was this appearing by the by the time i joined my father's business we were working with gurjari gujarat state handicraft and handloom corporation the managing the by slide number agia agia number agia number yeah yeah hmm yeah mr bridge basin he came to kutch and met my father and invite to my father to work with uh, uh gurjari uh, gurjari shop that gurjari is a government uh, ngo and uh, they are starting that time the managing director mr bridge basin and uh, he search many craft in kutch not only ajrak but uh, uh, weaver and uh, mm, uh, Uh, embroidery and pottery maker and all craft of kutch they are searching and invited to amdabad because at that time is head office in amdabad and uh, uh, much helping because they are sending some designer uh, um, sulekha gulri madhurima patni and archana sa and uh, they are uh, helping to uh, developing new uh, i suppose outlets maybe for the for the new product products. new product yeah new products so those have been the big changes so i i know that's been a part of your the focus of your research illinid about how the the roles of ngos and entrepreneurs and global business uh with printed uh textiles from india um and i know you've been also visiting this area for 30 years so uh what changes have have you witnessed in your time doing research there um i suppose specifically with with the countries that um the, the obviously there's been a shift from the local market to inter international increasingly they're working with fashion designers so it's gone from i think in the early days of gujri was making household goods it was um catering to urban consumers but now it's much more about fashion so producing yardage scarves stoles dupatta um and that's for clients in india and in um delhi because i think the countries um have sort of ridden the rise of indian um fashion in in global terms there's been a real um emergence of indian fashion designers so that 
um, you know, we're familiar with uh, Manny Sharora's work in the in the UK, and he's got a studio in Paris. So you know, he's he's probably the the biggest name. But other designers have come come through um, from India who are hitting um, in you know international markets, and the countries have been very much part of that. And it's introduced them to a greater variety of fabrics because um, oh, I think we're just looking at Anita Aurora. Um, that uh, formerly countries work mainly with cotton. Now they're working with um, silk, cotton silk, wool, and even linen. Um, you know, they will experiment with a whole, um, you know, with whatever op opportunities come up with, with fabrics. And I think one of the remarkable achievements specifically of Jabba's family, um, his um, brother Ishmael, Dr. Ishmael has been particularly active in that respect, is developing um, the, the palette of natural dyes. So um, you can almost do a rainbow of, of colors now. You, you can almost, um, you know, just say, oh, you know, I want orange with lime green. And they will, they will be able to um, achieve that with natural dyes. So there's been an awful lot of experimentation with dye stuffs and then networking with dyers around the world and um, picking up on uh, dyes that are not necessarily native to India. Um, so, you know, that expansion has been really exciting. And I think um, the, the Indian fashion world particularly has responded to that. Um, so I guess, you know, as I say, in terms of the countries, that's been um, the, the notable um, changes over over the last sort of 20 30 years and becoming more commercially viable or um, staying the same just different markets or really really a takeoff with this renewed expansion of global markets um i th i think um it, it it has it's it's certainly raised the profile of of the craft and i think more broadly you could say that of, of craft in india but i think also that exposure um introduces threats as well so one of the um concerns that i know Jabba is particularly consumed by is copying. Um, it's been that's been a particular issue for fabric, you know, the, those producing fabrics, whether it's print or embroidery or weave, that um, there are um, copies of Ashrak, copies of block print that are achieved by far uh, less laborious um, methods, and it. Um, it's an, and you know, and the, I think the problem is that very often they're passed off as you know a traditional, a traditional fabric, and um, it that can undermine the craft and it undermines the market for traditional craft. So that's where the the problem lies. It's not that you know technology is available. I think if it's up front and you know this is polyester azurac and it's sold as polyester azurac, that's no problem. But it's when it's sold to the Un, unwary as you know the authentic item so um the indian government has has responded to that it introduced um the geographical indications act um i think it was late 1990s but it was reintroduced in 2003 and that's the act that is active now so craft producers uh, have been encouraged since that time to register their craft with quite a detailed history and um, examples of it with um, the, the, the government of India. Um, and that is um, supposed to provide some protection. But throughout my research, I, um, when I was uh, sort of researching other block prints in other areas as well, um, I, I was asking um, the printers whether they're you know, I knew there were many instances of copying and, and it, it's rife, um, but whether there had been any court cases um, following um, these instances, and they said not. And the uh, president of the Calico printers in Sanganer, which is another sort of historic area for, for printing in Rajasthan, a um, chap called Bridge Balabudewal, who, like Jabba and, and Adam, is a national award winner, 
um, he he said, Elena, it's it's a marketing device. He said, I don't see it as um, a legal procedure in in that way. You know, it's not a way to pursue um, those trespassing on heritage. He said it's a marketing platform, and um, I I can't quite you know to me that's fine, but. Um, you know, if you've got these infringements on the app, surely there needs to be some procedure in place, but that's probably being British about it. So, you know, there is this um, supposed protection, the GI Act 2003, but nonetheless, this issue of copying remains, um, it does remain a threat to um, Ashraq and, and other crafts um, in this day and age where, you know, we've got digital printing and there have been some very high profile instances where Ashraq has been, you know, presented as uh, a, a, an example of Ashraq has been presented as, you know, authentic block printed Ashraq and actually it's not, it's a digital print um, or it's a screen print. So, um, you know, it is cause for concern. Uh, in our exhibition, we do have uh, several um, of naturally dyed block printed garments, uh, one made uh, for the Good Earth line by uh, another member of the Cudtree family that we have on display. And that was our decision, of course, for the exhibition to privilege those uh, fashion designers who are still uh, working with the, the hand printing and the natural dyes. Um, but on this topic of you know, uh, Ashraq having gone global again and being exported and um, it becoming a very global market. I'd like to ask, you know, Jabber about that, about what happened then during lockdown and COVID for the last year and a half, because we saw often in the news in North America about how, you know, COVID and the stops in um, international commerce were really affecting uh, businesses and craftsmen around the world. So if you could please tell us, I guess, Jabber and Adam, uh, how COVID affected your business over the last year and a half, um, you know, with the stop to the exports, and is it difficult to predict these global commercial uh, rhythms now? Uh, yes, uh, much affected uh, uh, COVID because the Many customer is uh, cancelled uh, uh, order and the number of new order reduces. We have work, but not uh, like the recent past when we making number thousand meters each month. But uh, that time is uh, stopped and uh, one and a half month is fully stopped because the here is lockdown and uh, nobody is come out. And uh, for first is we uh, uh, take priority for health because the, we have, we, uh, uh, okay, then business is future. We thinking like this, but uh, after uh, lockdown, one and a half month, slowly, slowly is uh, starting work and uh, uh, we making for own, um, Adam is making one uh, masterpiece for uh, that free time because the only uh, lockdown time, COVID time is free sitting. That one is uh, some uh, effect, uh, mentally effect also. Nobody meet and no talk. So we are in the, in the workshop in the, uh, and making some new design. Adam is making some, uh, uh, piece. I, Adam, I can we you. see your piece, please? Do Do you have it there? I know you showed it to us earlier. We, it, it's it, it's quite amazing. So I guess they he was using his uh, they were using their time as why? best creatively as possible. Can you tell us about it, Adam? Yeah. Why, why so, uh, first, I uh, tell you when uh, I uh, left my studies and I joined with my father in business. So in a, we are in a fashion market, so uh, demand is more, more demanding, people more giving orders. So I'm busy with my production and my uh, 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 with designer also uh, and uh, uh, sending and quality checking and printing and making paste. So whole day I'm busy with that. So I 
it i get chance with uh, in lockdown when i uh, all is stopped so i have in uh, my so i thought uh, uh, i i can now i i have time to learn to uh, make my own piece with my with my printing this is all i did and i think it and all did so inside a 3d effected so i inspired with lockdown so inside a light and dark uh print uh, uh, colors so it's like a situation so situation it's a sometime it's a dark and sometimes some days a uh, 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 day and some is a night so situation is everything happen so you can uh, uh, take uh, care with situation and uh, go ahead with the with, with the block printing and two sided. I'm sorry, you, you broke up a little bit, Adam. There, so I'm just going to repeat that. Uh, you said this is a meditation on dark and light, and night and day, and and the the challenges of COVID. Yeah. And I know, well, know Ilan, yeah, you so made the remark as well that you you feel it's very three dimensional. Yeah, isn't it just <laughs> design and I'm Design, uh, a 3D. 3D ah, houses. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually called 3D. It's called 3D. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, they give the wonderful titles. The one for the ROM is um, Honeycomb. Um, uh, all right. Thank you very much, Adam. So that, I think that that's a good segue for uh, the final question that I'll ask you both to reflect on. Um, and you've talked a little bit about it, but if you have more to say, this would be a, a good time. Um, and that is what challenges to the craft going forward. We've seen the history, how much things have changed, you know, Stephen, over the last 50 years um, and knowing where it came from, you know, what, what is the future? What, what are the opportunities and, and what are some of the challenges? So if we can start um, with either of you, please. So um, I think, uh, sorry, I'm just running in, Jabba Bai. Um, I would say the main challenge ahead of countries is is water. Um, yes. Kutch, you know, Kutch is um, a desert area, and the River Saran, which um, originally brought Jabba's ancestors to Kutch, dried up in 1989, 1990 because a dam was constructed in a nearby village in Tapa Village, a few miles from Damadka. So um, the, what, what the response to that was, uh, was to sink, sink tube wells. Um, and that's common practice with the agriculturalists in the area and even, even herders to ensure that you know, their animals have a, a regular supply of water. But that generates its own problems. So saline ingress and um, creeping desertification. So I think um, with the expansion of um, factories and other production units in Kutch all sapping the you know the availability of water that that's the real issue but Jabba perhaps you you could talk about your community's response to that so I think there's a slide up of uh, the central effluent treatment plant at Ajrakpur which your brother Ishmael Bai oversaw the development of yeah our ancestor is uh, choose the Damarka and uh, their river. That river is dry in 1990, uh, 89, 90. And after we uh, uh, want to water, so we are using well water in the uh, for a diesel pump and starting with this. And after some time, it water level go down. Then we are making tube well to take water and uh, we are working with uh, that water. And after more of uh, every year, 10, 15, 20 feet down, water level is go down because the Kutch is a desert area. Here sometime is uh, monsoon is good. Sometime some, some year is not coming uh, monsoon, uh, uh, rain. So this one is much problem. So uh, we are, every year 
20, 15, 20 feet down, go and uh, that after 200 feet is coming iron water. Then it's much affected and uh, iron in the natural dye is we are making for black color and that iron water is much problem. So we are filtered with uh, charcoal and uh, concrete. Concrete and uh, sand that pass to the water is in the charcoal and concrete, and then is uh, okay for uh, uh, using. And uh, after 2001, is coming big earthquake in the Kutch area. That time, our community is together and decided we we have no future here in Damadka. So why we, our houses and workshop all is finished in the earthquake. So we want to make new one. So why we go to other area, there is good water and uh, take a good facility for near uh, city. So uh, our children is uh, uh, educated and uh, uh, also bank, uh, uh, Facility. All bank, bank facility bank. and courier yeah. facility and uh, also um, health facility is uh, more in city area. So our uh, community is together and 10% uh, is selected and they is go everywhere in Kutch and searching where good water and where uh, people is uh, uh, for uh, inviting. So that uh, 10 people is come back and uh, giving report and uh, uh, and uh, the select area in near Bhuj, uh, Padar village. And there we want to, uh, we may, uh, take the uh, land in uh, uh, near Padar village and we put the name is Ajrakpur. Uh, Ajrakpur is uh, after earthquake. And uh, there is good water, deep water, and uh, but uh, there one problem is no drainage and no facility for outside going because the, this one is many people living there. Today is 200 houses there. So they're uh, using uh, uh, water. That one is not going to come out. So we are making... Uh, effluent treatment plant in uh, Ajrakpur and uh, five time recycle and after we are giving to irrigation for farmer and uh, like this. So this one is, uh, I think is uh, this uh, water is much uh, important in this work. Um, thank you. Uh... For anyone who may be interested in more on this topic, we do have a very short video in the exhibition where um, the countries were kind enough to host us for a few days in 2019, where we interviewed and took some footage and, and made more of this water story that we tell in the exhibition um, about the sustainability of, of the craft and of uh, consumption in general. So you've mentioned, the two of you have mentioned water, you've mentioned the issue um, of copying, is is there anything else that you would like to say about the future before we move on to questions? I, th I think education and training. So um, village schools in Kutch um, often, you know, d just don't open up. So um, the regularity of education in the rural areas can be quite um, erratic. Um, and uh, it, it means that people, you know, struggle to educate their children um, unless you can you can pay. Um, you, you know, if you have it, enough money, you can send your kids to English medium school, which is the that there for the upwardly mobile. But, um, you know, for just standard state education, it's um, it's not great. And I think another issue that concerns me is that very often um, girls' education stops with the onset of Menarc. Um, they're taken out of school at 12, 13. Um, and that's, that's a, a thing I've worked on with Rabaris, who are another community I've, I've worked with. But I know Jabba 
um, is concerned for training, that your children need training relevant to the modern modern world. You were saying about language and computers and business. Jabba bye. Is there anything either you or Adam wanted to add about um, the future opportunities and challenges? Yeah, because the, this uh, lockdown is uh, necessary for uh, computer and uh, internet because the, we are sitting in the home and uh, all working with uh, computer. They are giving uh, coming order in the uh, uh, mail, WhatsApp, uh, uh, and uh, we are uh, um, sending uh, goods to uh, by the courier, and we are sending some uh, picture for this one. This happened. This happened, and that we are sending some designs. They are selected, and they so uh, educate is good for uh, future because the now. Before is uh, uh, like I am working with Maiwa in uh, 90, uh, 96, Maiwa in Vancouver, Canada. The people is coming here in Dhamadka and uh, um, uh, we are uh, discussing and uh, uh, take uh, looking for patterns and uh, uh, but uh, now in lockdown, the uh, uh, only full uh, uh, they they are seen design, but cloth is uh, we are give hand that time we uh, feel. So this one is uh, I think. It, then no, I oh, know we seem to be having some 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 internet lag. Ironically, just as you're talking about the advantages, I guess, and disadvantages of doing commerce virtually, <laughs> we're going to have a few hiccups. Um, just I'll, uh, if, if it's OK with everyone, though, because I know we're running out of time, we're, I'm going to move on to some questions. And there's actually a question that builds right into what you were saying, Jabber. We have a lot of people who are interested, saying they, they see this is also beautiful. Um, how can they uh, get access to your products? And you just mentioned Mewa out of uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, Mewa Handprints Limited, uh, which carries and has been working with the countries for 30 years. Um, that is uh, the major place for us in Canada to access the, the real uh, hand dyed, uh, you know, hand block printed with natural dye Ajrak that you've been seeing on the screen. So that's Mayweather uh, located in Granville Island and Charlotte Kwan, who is the founder of that, um, kindly also uh, loaned pieces to our exhibition and our dye samples. So um, we have many connections to Mewa in Vancouver. Uh, so that was a question. A question for you, um, Jabber and Adam, as people were asking, do you label your products in any way so people know who made it and that it's natural dyed and hand block printed? So do you have a label that you put on so people know, or does it depend? So before we uh, didn't uh, try this one, so people knows about our work, people see and uh, said, oh, this is Jabba Bai work <laughs> or Mahmoud Siddiq work, Mahmoud Bai work. So it's uh, now it's uh, 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 changing. So uh, we, we are trying to make a website and uh, especially logo. Earlier we didn't give a name, but we gave the name of a place which uh, we started. The Ajrak House. I didn't get because uh, yes. started uh, from house. My grandfather and mother and three brothers started. If they, if they not thought uh, Ajrak will not show in in the world, so we are trying to give them the Ajrak House, and we Thank will uh, make website and and uh, tag name also in the future because the, we need to 
and knowledge also we need to learn also about that because this is a new uh, this is new thing we are know our all uh, uh, in our craft uh, printing dyeing everything colors people want to pastel colors now many people giving a, a, a light shade and dark shade and which this color and this color that is our subject but this is a new line after pandemic this is we started or we thought uh, how can we uh, 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 collect together all people so like uh, in in pandemic i started with zoom also uh, in uh, student uh, in bangalore and uh, indianian people also i'm teaching with online so we uh, we are making one platform of in uh, e-commerce so they are we are giving all information and brand name so people know about us this craft and really real craft real people and get real product amazing that's the name of the label azrock house okay uh, then i'll turn it to you do you do put when you sell your stoles and dupatta at exhibition come sales you do have you do have labeling and it's got your you know it's got your name and and it says dyed with natural colors so you do have that labeling at a, a smaller level yeah uh, we are uh, making block and uh, in the corner side we are giving that block the stamp my brother yeah. is started his uh, on a stamp imk ah I so it's gone, much. it's gone and from being anonymous to now you yeah. sign your work actually print sign your work yeah. Which is and clever because I, that's impossible to imitate. Yeah. And I am sending in the room that piece inside also AJM Khatri Damadka. We are put in the print in the down level. Bottom of bottom staff. bottom of the staff. border. Yeah, you actually wrote your signature, didn't you? Oh, can we see um Adam, before we end today, or can we please see uh, which slide that shows Honeycomb, the masterwork by your father? I think 28, number 28. 28. Thank you. It takes a village. Um, yeah, if we could see slide 28. Um, then uh, there is one more question for the countries. They said that they noticed, um, as we can see here, that some of the pieces look to be silk and not cotton. And is it different to work with silk? Um, as compared to cotton. Ah, go down. So, Jabber, yeah. if you can um, tell us about working on silk. Yeah, because the cotton is a little bit heavy, and uh, the cotton is needed is alkaline, and uh, we are uh, uh, producing silk is uh, alkaline is affected is uh, silk that uh, silk is gone i think it so we are not much using in the alkaline uh, in the silk process this is different uh i see so it, it all goes back to chemistry again and uh, the al alkaline and acid and having to adjust everything. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're getting a little mixed up in our slides. I don't want to miss this. This is the, the masterwork by um, Abdul Jabbar that is on display in our ROM exhibition and that uh, we were uh, able to acquire for the ROM. Um, and you can just see how intricate and just hearing all the steps that he talked about of having to use, you know, resist paste to get those white lines, how they crisscross over each other, the various shades of red and blue, which would have required, you know, separate dye baths, just how extraordinary uh, this piece really is. Um, and uh, I got to see, this is, I think his 18th piece, you know, we commissioned one and he made 18 until he was completely satisfied with the perfection in uh, the printing and the design. So we are incredibly fortunate to um, have received this final work, which he uh, titled Honeycomb. And I think you can see why, because of, um, uh, just the intricacy of it. So we're getting, I can see on the chat coming over, everyone saying, ooh, ah, how, how amazing, how beautiful. So um, if, uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? I see that our time uh, is running out. Um, 
I do see it has to do more with the exhibition. Um, someone in the USA is asking, um, when will the ban be lifted so uh, people can come and will the ROM be leaving the exhibition up any longer? Um, it, we have extended it now until January 2nd, 2022. I cannot give you any official news on the border opening. Everyone has their fingers crossed that we're all gonna be healthy enough on both sides to allow that soon. Uh, but it was originally supposed to close in September and it has been extended through January. So that does give uh, people a bit more time to see all these uh, amazing works, including that um, by Abdul Jabbar Khatri. So um, with that then, um, I want to thank Ilanid and Abdul Jabbar, we, and Adam, of course, we've reached uh, the end of our time. And we didn't have time to meet Adam's son, who is nine and who is now the 11th generation. And I have seen him uh, experimenting with printing. So I think we uh, have another reason to be hopeful about the, the future of, of Ajrak. So I want to thank Ilanid and Abdul Jafar and Adam for joining us for this program and hope that you would be able to visit the ROM and the exhibition. And you can uh, look for more curator conversations uh, on our ROM website. The next coming up will be July 28th. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to let everybody know who's been attending this series faithfully that on August 18th, we're going to have Rosemary Krill who will be speaking on scenes from a South Indian court, a newly discovered group of 17th century Kalamkari hangings, one of which we had on display when the exhibit opened up in uh, 2019. So thank you again, everyone for joining us. Again, special thanks to Abdul Jabbar, Adam and Ilanid who are joining us from different continents and time zones. And we look forward to seeing you again soon for Curator Conversations. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Sarah.